Welcome from the uh, from the three centers of the hypnotic universe, uh, uh, Fintan from Longford, and and Rich from Bristol, and myself from Dublin. So you're all welcome again. It's great to be you all, which is again, lads. Good stuff. Thank you, man. Great to be here. Yeah, great crack. So um, we started. We done it last week on uh, the VAK, um, the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic which is a great podcast. Thanks, lads, for doing it. So today we're going to be talking about the map is not the territory. We are indeed, Mark, yeah. yeah. So, so who would like to go for us and explain that? Would you like to explain it, Rich? Or yeah. Finkel? Yeah, go on, I'll do this. Uh, yeah, as you were saying, the map is not territory. It is the idea by a gentleman Alfred Korzynski, that's how you pronounce his name, I think. The only usefulness of a map depends on the similarity of structure between the empirical world and the map. So what does that mean for you? It means it's how we neurologically process information. So we all delete, distort and generalize in our thought processing in our speech and how we and how we deal with other people so for arguments a generalization will be this bunch of car drivers doesn't never indicate whereas this bunch of car drivers is very safe and steady on the road um distortion would be around um oh i caught some i caught a fish and it was 15 pounds when it's probably only three and deletion would be some long lines of just do it only be asking do what precisely but oh, that's going down a different route and a different track that we're not going to go down to today and yourself into what yeah i suppose just to, to reiterate what um rich is saying there basically what happens is as we go through our day uh, lots of stuff happens to us but if you spent if you were to recall everything that you did during the day you would actually spend an entire day recalling every single thing that you did so that's not really that much use to us so what we do is we tend to uh, as rich said generalize delete and distort what that means is we leave bits out deletion we distort we put more emphasis on one thing than on another and we generalize so we say well look for example if you ask a child uh, when they come home from school how was your day they'll say um oh it's the same as every other day you know, the teacher came in, we did some stuff and we got homework and we came home and that's their entire summation of what they did that day. Or quite often they'll say eh, nothing. <laughs> what did you do today? Nothing. And they go, OK, well, there's probably a little bit more to that than that. So that's really what um, what that is. It's just, as I say, generalization, deletion and distortion. Yeah, that, that's a great example, Filton, because that's every day I collect my little fella from school. What did you do today, Ryan? Uh, nothing. <laughs> 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 and, and then Kate, when yeah. she was younger, what did you do, do today? Nothing. Does this teacher not learn anything? You know, have a bit of crack with the car. Well, I'm going to that teacher, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So, like, as well as that, like, what I think of, of, um, of the map is not the territory as well. You probably agree with me. Like, if you're going to just say a country, Italy or wherever you're going to Spain, and you're looking at the map, like that's that's not what's going going on in the place. You know, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, because obviously that's a two D represent representation of the three D ground. Mm, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. So an example of uh, where somebody's map might be somewhat faulty uh, could be, for example, uh, a situation where, and this has happened to, I'd say, everybody at some point in time. So you see your friend walking up the road and you call them across the road to them, you call up the road to them, and they uh, they don't, they completely ignore you, they blank you. In fact, they start walking faster. Um, and you're going well what happened there like why are they ignoring me did i do something wrong on them or did they do something and then they're afraid that i'll 
you know, be annoyed with them over it or what's, what's the story, you know? Where in fact, in that particular situation, you don't realize that they're actually wearing earphones and yeah. they're running for a bus and they realize, oh, the bus is late. So they don't hear you calling and they're just trying to get that bus. So uh, what you have then is two completely distorted situations, uh, two completely distorted viewpoints of what's actually going on, you know? And that's really where um, understanding that the map is not the territory is, is so important, you know? Yes, where you've taken, so you've assumed something and you've got it completely wrong. Because they're plainly not ignoring you, they're concentrating on something else. And I've got another model for you as well. So this comes from New Code NLP, and I believe it's developed by Carmen Boston Sinclair. So again, you've got visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactoring, gustatory. So that's all the input that comes in. Everything we see, hear, smell, eat always comes in somewhere. Goes into a processing unit in your brain and comes out in your first access and then comes out in your second filter. And that's then onto a map. And then you get your feed forward and your feedback loops. And when you're ready to process that information, that comes in your output, which is then your behaviors, your actions, and your responses to maybe what you've been said what you've listened to, what you've watched, what you've felt, what you've eaten, and what you've drank and smelt. Does that make sense to you, lads? No, really, no, it's, that's, that's a great point, yeah, really good point. Like, I could ask you, ask you uh, Fintan, um, in, in, your own, um, in your own opinion, uh, what generally, um, what, what what examples could you give that in your your experience that people generalize, you know, um, you know who, who, who like could use the map is not the territory, um, model better, so to speak. Right. Well, I suppose the thing about it is that everybody has different maps. Mm. So, um, what we need to recognize is that our map isn't necessarily the right map that's someone else's map uh they're coming from a completely different viewpoint and that their map is as valid as ours in fact uh, i think it was george box said that no uh, no map is actually uh correct it's just uh, how useful it is or not and i think john grinder said something similar you know the value of a model and that's all a map is is a model of the world or a model of an area um, and so what we do is we tend to take a model and that maybe worked for us once and we use it over and over and over again. So uh, what we need to do is recognize that everyone has their own model, their own map of the world, and that um, I suppose respecting that map of the world is important, but also under, it helps us to understand where we're coming from, um, where the other person is coming from, and that, you know. Um, so for an example of a situation uh, where that might be is like the idea of uh, a number of blind men feeling an elephant, right? And what there is, so they're only given a portion each. So one has the tail and says, oh, an elephant is like a piece of rope. Another has a leg and says, oh, an elephant is like a tree, you know, an elephant, uh, someone else has the tusk, someone else has the trunk, you know, so to each of those uh, people, the elephant is a completely different animal. They would never recognize each other's description of the of the elephant, if that makes sense. So likewise, uh, so the thing about that is that, yes, it's important to recognize other people's uh, map of the world, but it's also to recognize that no map is, is well, to say the least, is perfect. Um, uh, the only way you could have a perfect map would be if it was an absolutely uh, inch to an inch uh, or centimeter to a centimeter perfect map of the world and in, that's the case and in 3D as Rich said earlier and if that was the case then it uh, wouldn't be very useful to you as a model um, so uh, yeah so I suppose the thing about it is that uh, quite often we do have people and they um, 
we'll see things from different viewpoints and sometimes being able to see where the other person is coming from can be quite important. So if you want, I can run through, um, I suppose, a process yeah. uh, where, um, where, for example, you have a situation where you were in, in a scenario with somebody. I suppose everybody can, can relate to this, really. And the other person was coming from a completely different viewpoint and you couldn't understand each other why they were saying what they were saying to you or why they did what they did to you or, or what why they did what you thought of what they did and they can't see your viewpoint either so if you want to uh, i can run through the process with you would you like to try that mark and rich yeah that'd be brilliant yeah, yeah. 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 right that'd be very useful for the, the listeners yeah okay. wouldn't it lads? yeah and actually if you're if you're listening at home and you want to try this yourself if you can think of a scenario where uh, perhaps you you know found yourself in a situation where you felt that people were, um, I suppose, either person or, or people were, you know, looking at you in a certain way or thinking about you in a certain way, and you're not actually sure that that's actually the case, you know. Uh, so what we can do is, I suppose, if you want to just um, close your eyes and take a deep breath for a moment. That's it. Just breathe into your mouth. and out through your nose, and into your mouth, and out through your nose. And just feel a relaxation and down from the top of your head. So you feel your face start to soften, down your neck, each breath, feeling more. And more relaxed. Feel your shoulders relaxing, your arms, and your hands. And as you relax, feel your torso relaxing, your chest, your stomach, your back, your lower back, your thighs. your calves, as all the tension runs out of your body, down through your feet and out through your toes, nice and relaxed. That's right. So now imagine you're sitting in a chair, and you're recalling an incident where you were felt that you didn't understand exactly what was going on or the other person didn't understand you. And imagine now that they're sitting in an opposite chair. And they too, like you, have their eyes closed and are relaxing now. And what you can feel is all of the information you have about that person. anything you've learned from them, stuff they've said to you, stuff you remember consciously, but also all of the things they've said and about themselves, about their past lives, about their current life. Perhaps it's someone from work and they've said stuff to you about their home life. Perhaps it's someone in a relationship with you and you know there's something going on And as all of that information gathers, you can feel it going into the person that you, as you imagine them sitting in the chair opposite you. All the stuff you've learned consciously, and in particular, the stuff you've learned unconsciously. You can feel that flowing out from you into the person as you imagine them in the chair. That's right. So now, what I want you to do is feel yourself floating up from the chair. So your body stays in the chair. But you 
are floating up above yourself. And you float across into the other chair. And that person has left their body. And you float into them. And you feel yourself in their body. You're wearing the clothes that they would have been wearing. You feel yourself. If you look in the mirror now, you see their face. You see their body. Feel yourself sitting the way that they would sit. Breathing, perhaps, as they would breathe. And as you do so, you imagine them saying the words that they said to you and how it feels from their point of view. Perhaps you notice their tone of voice and perhaps it seems a little different now from the way you saw it. And you can hear them listening to you saying what you said. Let's see how that feels. Perhaps it gives you a better understanding of the person, of how they were feeling at the time, what they were thinking. And now what I want you to do, and you get some an understanding of that, to so take your time to process that. And now float up on their body. and stand between the two and watch the conversation from the point of view of an onlooker. So both have their eyes open now and are engaged in the conversation and the situation. And see how an onlooker would see it, how they would feel about it, somebody who didn't know either of you. And that hopefully will give you a better idea of what actually is going on with the situation. And when you've taken the time to do that, just float back over into your own body and feel the life coming back into you. So you feel the energy moving up from your toes to your feet and your legs. Taking a deep breath and then deep exhale. And as the energy flows up to your body, fills your body, your arms, your neck, your face and your head. Take a moment to take a stretch or a yawn. Open your eyes. And welcome back. I hope that was useful to you. Did you find any use out of that? Any benefit from that? Yeah, I thought that was a great exercise, Fintan. Thanks so much. Because I was thinking of a scenario where I would have had a, an argument with somebody before. But by actually um, going into that chair, yeah, I really felt like I was able to understand um, why they, they felt like that. So it was, it was great. And then to be the middle person, uh, looking on to the to to the uh, situation that was happening, he like then then he like the middle person, the third person, was there agreeing with me. So it was you know, <laughs> you know I, I don't, that's probably myself like thinking I'm right, but uh, but it's it's funny because but the third person did listen, you know. So I thought it was great, really good. How did you find it, Finn, uh, Rich? I used to thought I was enjoying the relaxation more actually, but then I did eventually go into looking at somebody else and their perception of a situation I was going through and how they really didn't want to deal with um, what I was going through because whatever reason, um, not that I determined it, I don't think they really want to deal with it, I don't think they want to be around at the time, and yeah. So, yeah, it's a useful tool, but uh, I think got more of the relaxation out of it than that. Uh... It's just no harm anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
No, and look, okay, if someone's listening at home and all they get is a bit of relaxation out of it, well, then <laughs> no, I'm sure it's brilliant for all the listeners. I'm sure it's it's really, really helpful. So it was very well done, Fintan. Very well done, wasn't it? Rich, yeah. Very, very Thanks well very done. much. Yeah, very well done. So I suppose um, I can ask you your question, Rich. Um, how would you um, help people with, with a map of, of, of their map? How would you kind of... Um, help people help somebody how could they develop a, a better map develop that a better, map. That'd yeah. be a better question yeah a, another way would be third perceptual person is in where you can project yourself and look at your actions and behaviors and look and listen to what you're doing and what you're going through at the time and what the other person is saying to you and how they were acting together because ultimately, like I'm sure you tell your kids, Mark, and maybe you, Finton, is you are not your behaviours to your children because then that can impose a child is X, Y, and Z when well, actually not. So you would turn around and say, you're a bad child. No, they're not a bad child. Their behaviours are bad. So it's get a way to reflect on them to how they look at what they're dealing with, what they're going through in certain situations. Yeah, I use that a lot. Um... Uh, I, I do use that a lot, but especially Ryan, because if he's been naughty or, and it really works, you know, you say to him, <clears throat> you're not bold, it's just a bold behaviour, you know, and he, and when you do it all the time like that, for, any, for everybody that's listening, you, you, you kind of, they, they, they understand and then they, they, they change it because they don't want to have a bold behaviour and it even work, it works for any of your kids, like, it, and it, it, like, once you know you're not your behaviour, it, it is, it, it is important, isn't it? It is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise you end up with labels. And so like I'm a bad child or I'm stupid or whatever it is that has been labelled onto you, you would end up going into identifying and having that belief about yourself, which is then very hard to remove and adjust. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, because even like it could help them in school, in a school scenario as well. When mm -hmm. you're instill, you're, if you're helping your own children at home by um, saying it's not you, it's your behaviour. If just say they 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 broke a, a glass or my son there yesterday did something, <laughs> and uh, but he's a bit, bit old. He's he's nearly he's he's nearly eight, seventeen, eighteen. But uh, I should have started started that a long time ago. Sorry, God, I wouldn't know this stuff so long ago. <laughs> but um, no, but it, no, I wouldn't say it's that's that's probably wrong. It's not too late. Like you know, um, it's never too late to kind of instill this because when they're in school, then when you're, you, you can kind of know that, and it can you can work out for a teacher. You know, if you know, you'll know your what you're doing in school as well. Mm -hmm. Very much so, Mark. Yeah, and another way you can build somebody else's map up is how Richard Bander and um, John Puslick started off was they would have a couple of chairs and they would sit in one chair and then they would use that chair as say a parent or a situation they're dealing with and ask a question, sit in that other chair, then respond to that question, sit back in the other chair and go back and forth with them. Be careful you don't break up your own furniture though when you're doing that. <laughs> use plastic chairs as yeah, yeah, garden furniture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose just to reiterate what Rich is saying there, um, absolutely, it's great for uh, children of all ages, you know, from 0 to 100. Uh, really does. I mean, there's lots of adults out there who don't actually realise that they've been carrying this around all of their lives, not realising that they're not actually their behavior they're not actually um they think there's something wrong with them they're they feel that they have some uh you know mental health issues or whatever it might be but they're not actually their mental health issues they're actually a person who has something and that can be dealt with you know and i think that's important for people to understand that that it doesn't matter what age you are that you can deal with it and um you're still yourself you're a good person and uh, you just whatever you may have done at some point in time you may have had a behavior you can change that behavior you aren't that behavior and that applies to as I say children from not to 100. Indeed and I think one of the 
the most disingenuous things that goes around in say therapy is telling people that they're broken i don't think no, i don't believe anybody's broken no. we either have really useful maps and or not really useful maps and the more yeah. useful we can make our map the better it is for for all of us ultimately That's even if you just point. increase your map by say an inch or two and you just get a better definition of that situation you're in who you are yeah, no, that's a great point, Rich. Yeah, great point. Because I suppose I heard something before um, a couple of years back. Um, and you hear a lot in NLP training where um, they basically say every behavior has a good intention. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because subconsciously, your brain, your subconscious is there to protect you. And all your habits, good and bad, are there to protect you from whatever situation it is whether that's from harm, whether that's from a punishment, whether that's from something else, a protection. Yeah. So it's there to, yeah. Protect you, to protect you from harm and or maybe protecting other people. From, you caused harm to other people maybe as well. Absolutely. Uh, people, people don't want to hurt other people. And sometimes people tell little lies just because they don't want to hurt the other person. But in fact, sometimes the person has to hear that, <laughs> you know, um, and the same applies to yourself. Sometimes we don't want to hear the truth about ourselves, but actually hearing it means then that we can deal with whatever uh, the scenario is, whatever the situation is better done and, and grow then as a result, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Like there are people who, for example, uh, feel anxious and what happens is they don't know why they feel anxious, but of course, what's happening is their unconscious mind feels uneasy about the situation. They feel that perhaps they, um, you know, might get hurt in this situation, or yeah, you know, so they, it says okay, and it puts a block on them. And I think we covered that in the ego states as well uh, uh, podcast, and uh, and that you know, so um, yeah. So basically, as I say, every behavior has a good intention behind it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And as well, to go with that, Finton, I think it's yeah. how people also build up that picture and make that picture so big, it becomes, in their mind, an unbearable scene. Mm. They're just not able yeah. to cope with and until they manage to string that down, maybe black and white out, and then shoot it off into the distance or whatever, then they'll be able yeah. to deal easier with that situation they may be coming up to confront. Because you are the movies that you make in your own mind. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and, and it works. Uh, I met a friend of mine, actually, um, for coffee there a while back. And, you know, I was just chatting to her. I hadn't been talking to her in a long time. And uh, we were there, and it just we just met by coincidence on the street. And the coffee shop was there. So we said, you know what? We sat outside, had a coffee. It was a lovely uh, sunny afternoon or sunny morning, actually, it was. And... Um, so I just asked her how things were and she said there was something on her mind and she was a bit anxious about a meeting she was having. So I got her to do that and just there and then got her to picture how she was imagining the picture, got her to freeze frame it, turn it black and white and just follow exactly what Rich said there, shrink it down. Uh, I think I got her to smash the glass and then fire it off into the sun and she started to say that she already started to feel better about it. And then I met her a couple of weeks later and she said, um, actually, yeah, and the meeting went an awful lot better than she did. And she actually gets on well with the guy now, you know, it was uh, it was a work thing and uh, she hadn't been expecting any of that, you know. So she had, I suppose, been worrying unnecessarily about it, you know. So, um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, that, that's great. That's a great example. And maybe you tell me that story before, Fintan, it's brilliant, yeah, because they be known as modalities and submodalities. Uh, th th that's what they're called, isn't it? And I, I touch, I kind of touch on uh, Rich points, Rich's point a bit earlier on. He mentioned habits, and what, what like it's on a different kind of a different side now. When I started this NLP off a couple of years back, when I I, I stumbled across it by total accident, I was on on the driving home from my mother's one time, and there was a radio program on. Um, and uh, who was on it? Um, an Irish guy, Irish hypnotist. Um, 
on the radio. His name escapes me. He'll come to me. Um, but uh, it was it was really good. Cool. Fitzpatrick was it? Oh, Fitzpatrick. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. Yeah, you read and, my mind. Say again. What's that? You read my mind, Vincent. <laughs> yeah. That's the only Irish one I can think of. Oh, same same here. been on the radio. Yeah, same here. Yeah, no, but it was, it was great. Like, and it got me hooked instantly. You know, it's the next day. I was checking out his podcast and. It's gas the way, you know, something you listen to kind of brings you on. But the point I want to make, what, what, what really what really started me off really was um, you kind of put a list of stuff, your important stuff to do every day. Just say it's exercise in the morning or um, whatever, uh, reading a book or going for a run or stuff you enjoy. It's, if, by writing the things down and ticking it off, you, you feel satisfaction. Well, I felt satisfaction. So, mm -hmm. if anybody's listening, it's a good idea. I found it really helpful for me to like, because you know, before that, you 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 do, it, but you wouldn't do it because it's not by writing it down. It kind of makes you makes makes you kind of do, it, you know, and you feel great after it. Have any of you experienced that, or what way do you do it yourselves? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I do find that I know every day I'll go, okay, I have this to do, that to do, that the other thing to do. But until I've actually written it down and then I can uh, mark it off, then I, I'm i less likely to do it, put it that way. Uh, I suppose it's a bit like um, uh, Stephen Coveney in the, the book, you know, The Four Quadrants. Uh, he has, you have stuff that's urgent, or stuff that's important, but not urgent. You have stuff that's uh, urgent, uh, or, but not important. You have stuff that's um, uh, urgent and um, and important. Did I do that one already? And you know, sorry, you know, I'm after confused myself. So you have urgent and important, urgent uh, but not important, important but not urgent, and uh, not urgent and not important. All right. So a lot of people spend time on stuff that's not urgent and not important. So things like scrolling on Facebook, things like that, uh, going on to Instagram, just scrolling. Uh, obviously, if you're doing it for work, then it's a different situation. Uh, so that's not urgent and it's not important, but actually people spend an awful lot of time doing that. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of people get stuck in the uh, urgent and important. So what's happened is they've taken something important and neglected it to the extent that now it's urgent and it has to be done now. And basically, they spend their lives going around putting out fires. Um, whereas, in fact, the most important thing to do is look at the stuff that's important but not urgent and get that done now out of the way before it becomes urgent. Uh, and that's really where people should spend most of their time. So like that, if I have, if I don't write out the list and don't do it from the list, then what happens is it becomes urgent and important to the situation where I'm running around putting out fires, you know, and uh, and that. So that's yeah. So that's just kind of that's my experience of uh, the difference between making a list and doing it, and not making a list, and just letting it slide, you know. Absolutely. And there is, I think it's Pomodoro timekeeping, time management, where you limit yourself to doing a task for say 25 minutes, give yourself a five minute break. And then go off and do something completely different. So what that needs is an open loop that you want to come back and complete that task. I don't know if you come across the open and closed loops. Mm. Yeah, I've heard of that before. Yeah. So an open loop is something that's not been done, and then you have to go back and close that loop, otherwise it'd be playing on your mind. And it was discovered by a uh, Romanian or Hungarian psychiatrist, psychologist, Zygernic, as a Zygernic loop is known as. And so she was. Oh, in, yeah. Yes, yeah. I believe she was in a restaurant back in the day. And she was asking waiters at all about how they would easily remember. But when they came back afterwards, they go, they wouldn't remember because they just wiped that from the memory because it wasn't read into them. They completed that task, they've got it over and done with, then they're off to somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that all right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and of course it does happen to <laughs> so many people. Yeah, like we might we might share that the name of that book that you mentioned as well, Fintan, uh, on the show notes for for people to get as well. Um, oh yeah, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. 
Yeah, and there's good few TED talks on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's one thing I heard there today on another another podcast. Um, Mike Mandel's uh, brain brain software uh, podcast, which is really good. It's well worth checking out. Um, he he basically said I've heard it before, but the way he puts it is really good. He says that, you know, just say. It comes back maybe to ego states as well, which is it's it's a it's a great thing. I've only discovered him lately myself, but like what he does is you know he's not in the humor for doing training or do exercise or he's not not in the mood. He might he'll do it for I think it's ten minutes for, could be could be right, but ten minutes he do it for, and by doing it for ten minutes, he ends up doing the whole lot because he's made that start, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah which you know it's, it makes a lot of sense to kind of build a habit like that you know yeah and what some other people do is when they're watching their favorite tv program maybe they'll smash some fizz out then yeah so you can i think Fint was going to talk about that it was a bit of habit stacking where you can do something and you can add something else on top just to make your day run a bit smooth and add in extras as well yeah, I was I was thinking that we could maybe cover that in another podcast, but um, habit stacking just generally or briefly is, uh, say, for example, in the morning, you have you, we all have habits, and what you can do is use those habits to um, to like uh, Rich says there to make our day more more smoothly. So, for example, you get up out of bed. Uh, for example, your next thing might be drink a bottle of water or drink drink some water drink some coffee go to the toilet brush your teeth well all these things we do have these habits and especially if you're going to work so you have to follow step by step once you've done the getting up out of bed the next thing is uh you go to the kitchen or whatever next thing you do you get dressed you or you get washed you get dressed you get out the door get into the car and the thing about it is that you know once you've done the first thing that the next thing is going to happen for example once you get in the car you know that in X amount of time, you're going to be pulling up outside work and you're going to be going in and you know then you go in the door, you clock in or whatever you do, you switch on your computer and you start your day. And you know that that's all going to happen because of habit stacking. So what you can do is create your own habits, decide, well, what are the habits that I want to keep? And maybe there are habits that you don't want to keep. For example, you might wake up when the alarm goes off and you might spend 20 minutes, half an hour scrolling on your phone, you know, <laughs> and you might say, well, that's 20 minutes, half an hour that maybe I could have spent differently, you know, and even if it just means that you could have got 20 minutes extra sleep, <laughs> you know, then that's fair enough. But what you can do is, uh, I suppose, until now, we've been uh, creating habits unconsciously. So just as they are needed, as they come up. Whereas what we can do is choose what habits we want to. So, for example, you might want to, if you just jump straight out of bed when the alarm goes off, um, then you've saved 20 minutes there or wherever it is. Now, it might still take you a little bit longer to wake up, but you can go and you can start going about your daily habits. You know, for example, if you want to get up early and go to the gym or go for a run, then what you do, you put on your gym clothes, or your running clothes, and you get out the door, and once you know you've gone out the door, uh, you know you're going to do that run, you're going to go to the gym, or wherever the case might be, you know. So, um, so yeah, it, that's the power of habit stacking, where you do it uh, consciously, you decide deliberately what it is that you're going to do, and then your unconscious mind just takes over from there and runs that program for you each time. Yeah, that's great. That's great, Fintan, because there's a great book called The Power of Habits, you just re- remind me of there when you were saying that it's a really good book as well talking about um like I, I, her name is escapes me um who, who wrote it um but it's it's it's, it's a really good one like and um it, it's it, and it's a great great explanation thanks very much for thinking because what i was thinking as well was you know people would be saying to you how on earth do you get to do all this stuff like you know <laughs> in the morning like do your your exercise and do that and the whole lot well, what you say to them is because it's habit stacking, it, it doesn't take any t- more time at all because I have to brush my teeth. I have to make me breakfast and we're doing me exercise, you know, so it all links in very well, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, it does. It really does. Yeah. No, I just thought you might have something to add there, lads. <laughs> no, I think we covered it then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we get get that that book, get the book. Yeah, it's really good. But uh, another thing we were talking about there during the week, we we're going to mention on the podcast as well, was uh, which I feel it's very good for for anybody really, even for kids in school or anybody um, who's who's learning anything. Um, when you when you teach something that you've learned, it's like learning it twice, isn't it? Like you know, just say for instance, if if we're teaching like something we've learned in LLP. The, the phobia cure we might uh, we might talk about the next time or another podcast like if you're teaching that and even for your child and get them to teach it back to you you're, you're learning loads of times you know yeah it makes you more effective in wiring that neurology towards that um subject that you're learning yeah and the more you build that connection in your brain helps know what wires together fires together so you get a better connection you react quicker to a situation and you get that drilled into your mind to build up that myelination in your brain and then you do pretty much subconsciously then which is where again going back to habits that's where all that comes from is that myelination and all those connections in the brain just got really really good connections and then eventually you break the habit they will die off mm. i find um just to, I suppose, reiterate what Rich is saying there, just to say that um, when I'm learning something, if I have to teach it, I learn it as if I'm going to have to teach it, because then what that means then is that when I go and try and explain to somebody else um, how it works, I think it was you who said to me, Rich, at one stage, that uh, you should be able to explain it to a five-year-old or whatever in simple yeah. terms without it... Uh, you know, it'd been overcomplicated that they should understand it. And it, what that does to me then, it means then that I actually understand it better, that they're asking me questions. And if I don't know the answer, then I know, okay, that's something I haven't picked up from my learning. So I need to go back and so it helps me to learn better mm -hmm. um, really, uh, by, by teaching it to, to someone else. Yeah. And I'm sure you've done that with your kids, haven't you, Mark? taught them something and then hopefully they've been taught you something in exchange oh yeah all the time like you know it's it, 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 it's it's a it's a great like i find it really 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 um helpful for for my for my kids like even for instance i was i was there with my daughter the other day and she was um i was telling her how to do the the, the kind of she's a, she's terrified of mice you know <laughs> she's she, uh, she just just can't stand the, the even the sight of mice so i explained how the I didn't do I didn't show her how I kind of shown her how the concept works on the phobia cure and she said oh dad we'll have to practice that to get to, together tomorrow but it never worked out it never materialized but it's something I will do but you're always kind of teaching even by by saying that you know even by saying to them that um like we we're talking about earlier on by it's not if you're not bold it's a bold behavior you're doing that's that's teaching them a valuable lesson and what we do as well, which is really, really good, is morning at night time before the kids get, get uh, go to bed, we which which will help anybody that's listening, which is really good. That if you get them ready for bed, like get them ready for the, the next day, get their cereal ready, their bowl ready, get their clothes prepared, it, it stops all the um the arguments the next day because it's it's built it's given them a valuable lesson for the being be organized, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea, Mark. Yeah, yeah. You, you must do that, a bit of that in, in um with, with with the scouts, Fintan. Do you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a very useful thing to 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 have. You know, to to do. Yeah. In, in, like, what what could you think of a little scenario? You you kind of use uh, something similar to that in in, in the scouts or. So would you be prepping all the kit before you go out and taking the kids with you to? Sorry, Rich, what was that? I was just wondering if you would actually take the kids with you when you're prepping to go ready for a camp or, you know, get them the same. Well, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what we do is we meet usually the week, the meeting before the camp, we get the kids um, 
to get all the gear out, you know. Uh, so the thing is, they know what gear they need, um, and that. But the whole way for the weeks before any camp, we're preparing for the camp. We, um, we, you know, for example, uh, we do tent pitching with them, so we make sure that they know how to pull up the tents, so they don't just arrive in a situation where maybe in adverse conditions where they have to pull up the tent and not know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And we, um. We also do cooking with them so that because they have to cook for themselves uh, over the course of the camp. Uh, and there's other stuff involved as well. But yeah, basically, we spend a week getting uh, doing each of the things that they need to, to be able to do to, to take part in the camp successfully, you know. Uh, and then, as I say, the, the meeting before the uh, camp, we get them to take all the gear out and they know what gear they need. Um, Generally speaking, so we just make sure that everything's out. Yeah. Yeah, look, there's some really good takeaways we've given to the listeners tonight, lads. You know, like like starting starting off with a map is a territory, just to kind of surmise what we've done. And th- yeah, so that, that's a big one, like for 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 people to think about, like, you know, for for to have less confrontation in their lives with with with, with, with their family or people they work with and all that kind of stuff it can really help that way. That's right, Mark. And I also think it's very useful for people to respect other people's maps. Yeah. It may not be as useful or as good as what mm. your map is, but it's still their map and you should still respect theirs. Um, yes, there are obviously some maps that are pretty abhorrent and maybe not don't deserve respect. They may need some re-education in how their map isn't so good as somebody else's, but it should still be respected all the same. Yeah, no, that, that's great, Rich. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. So yeah, this has been this has been great. Um, doing this podcast again. Um, uh, with the Bermuda Triangle NLP, <laughs> we we're going to call it officially, weren't we? Because <laughs> uh, we meet halfway between England and Ireland and do a podcast, you know. And it's funny to have the bridge behind you there and the water, you know. <laughs> but uh, what, 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 who would like to? Yeah. So, so Fint is gonna give us the meta six for today. <laughs> so the, the meta six is not a metaphor. It's much better than a metaphor, and it's far better than the meta five. It's the meta six. So take away Fint. <laughs> okay. Um. So yeah, last weekend I uh, had a great weekend um, hiking in the mountains in Mayo. Uh, the idea was to climb uh, Mulray. There's actually three peaks up there, and um, but uh, one of the things we had, of course, to aid us was uh, we had a map, and we also had two apps running um, on the phones, and we had an ordinary compass. And uh, the thing is that um, as we were going up the mountains, uh, you know, it was a tough going. The weather went against us then and we had driving rain and that sort of thing. But uh, that said, it was very enjoyable. Now, up to last week, I was doing a, a course uh, on biodiversity. And one of the things I was learning on that was about different plants and animals, you know, insects and stuff like that you'd find. Uh, and we were working uh, in a bog, in the, around the bog, you know. So what was interesting then was on the way down, uh, one of the things that a map will tell you is that, oh, there is bog here. <laughs> but what it won't tell you is where can you put your feet? <laughs> because if you put your feet in one spot, you'll sink. And if you put your feet in another spot, it'll be firm, you know. So uh, it was quite interesting, actually. And as I was going down the mountain particularly I was noticing that and but also I was noticing all the different flowers and different um, animals that we could see and trying to name them and there was a number of us there and we were all trying to say well what particular flower is that and uh, one of the things that came up was uh, we were passing through some ferns only to realize that they weren't ferns because there's a difference between ferns and bracken and these were bracken and up to a week before that, I had no idea <laughs> what the difference was. So it was really nice to be able to take the time out and to just um, to recognize exactly what was going on and exactly what the thing is. 
So there's no way you're going to get all of that on a map, you know? So I suppose um, the question you can ask yourself at the end of all of that is, when was the last time you took time out just to see what's going on around you, to see, look at the little things around you, um, to see the things that you've taken for granted, whether it's uh, things like uh, insects, things like um, different flowers, different plants, and what are the the things that they have in common? Uh, are they the things that set them apart from all the other uh, plants and animals? As we go through our day, generally, things all look the same. We were talking about generalization there. We say, oh, look at all those flowers. Well, what flowers are they? Look at all those insects, what insects are they? These are all the little things that actually make our world work. Because without insects, there's no pollination. Without plants, there's no food. You know, so um, yeah. When was the last time you took time out just to have a look in detail, in a little bit more detail at what actually is around us, all the stuff that we generalize, all the stuff that we don't even notice. Maybe take some time out and uh, notice those things. All right. That that's that's great. That, that's mm -hmm. that's a metaphor and a and a empowering question all in one. <laughs> great stuff. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thanks very much. Michael, <laughs> well done, Fintan. Brilliant, brilliant. So what we'd love, um, we thanks a million for all the listeners, first of all. Um, it's been great doing the podcast for you. So I hope you're getting a lot of gold out of it. But uh, what we'd love you to do is for the next podcast, you can email us um, and ask any questions we'd like, to, like us to discuss on the podcast. would be brilliant. So our email address is NLP upskill Upskill. Oh god, yeah, somebody finish it after. <laughs> I'm trying to blank there. Yeah. NLP upskill your life at outlook.com if I'm not right. Hey, That's that. right. Upskill your life so at hotmail. NLP upskill your life at hotmail.com. Oh, there you go. See Fintan knows. Go easy on us, go, go easy on us, folks. This is only <laughs> our, our, our third <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. And it's a new email address, so yeah. That's right. <laughs> no, I, re I really uh, hope you've got really enjoyed it. And thanks a lot, um, Fintan and Rich, for for uh, for this again. That's all, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, cheers, Mark. It's been really good and some good good insights from yeah, yeah. So remember, join us again for the next podcast. Um, this is going to um, next Tuesday again. So take care of yourselves and make sure you 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 check out uh, Fintan's and Parent question. Thanks very much. Awesome. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.